Good afternoon. I hope you're all well and staying safe. It is hard to believe that it has been over a year since the pandemic began and the world changed forever. During this unprecedented time, we have gone from a world with digital to a digital first world. Digital experiences have played a vital role in making every aspect of our lives possible, from keeping families and coworkers connected, to enabling new ways of learning, to powering digital commerce, and ensuring continuity of essential business operations. Overnight, we have transitioned to a global digital economy. Adobe's mission is to change the world through digital experiences. At Adobe, we're helping fuel the digital economy with our continuous innovation, our large and diverse set of global customers and partners, and the unique expertise we have garnered from undergoing our own digital transformation. Our strategy of unleashing creativity, accelerating document productivity, and powering digital businesses is mission critical in driving our top and bottom line growth. Adobe had an outstanding first quarter with strong results across Creative Cloud, Document Cloud, and Experience Cloud. We achieved $3.91 billion in revenue in Q1, representing 26% year-over-year growth. Gap earnings per share for the quarter was $2.61, representing 33% year-over-year growth, and non-gap earnings per share was $3.14, representing 38% year-over-year growth. In our digital media business, we drove strong revenue growth in both Creative Cloud and Document Cloud in Q1, achieving $2.86 billion in revenue, representing 32% year-over-year growth. Net new digital media annualized recurring revenue, or ARR, was $435 million, and total digital media ARR exiting Q1 grew to $10.69 billion. This past year, we have seen the tremendous power creativity has to inspire, connect, and entertain us. Whether it's a student uploading his video assignment, a social media influencer advocating for change, or a small business owner designing her first website, everyone has a story to tell. Creative Cloud remains a market leader in core creative categories, including imaging, design, video, screen design, and illustration, and we're expanding that leadership into emerging media types like 3D and AR. Creation and consumption across phones, tablets, and desktops is exploding. We're building solutions for every surface and platform, enabling customers of every skill level to create whenever and wherever inspiration strikes. Our Behance community has grown to 25 million people, and programs like Adobe Live provide ongoing forums for creatives to engage as a global community. In November, we turned Adobe Max, our annual creativity conference, into a global digital event, culminating in 10 million live streams. Creative Cloud has truly become the world's creative engine, and our future opportunities are endless. Q1 Creative Cloud performance was strong, with net new Creative Cloud ARR of 337 million and revenue of 2.38 billion. Q1 highlights include strength in our student offering, enabling next-gen creators to tell their stories in the midst of an unprecedented remote learning environment. Momentum in our team's offering, demonstrating the increased demand for collaboration solutions globally. Growth in our core creative categories, including imaging led by Photoshop and Lightroom. Demand for Premier Pro, the leader in the exploding video category and the overwhelming favorite at the Sundance Film Festival for the third year in a row, with 68% of films using it. Significant growth in our creative mobile applications, including Lightroom Mobile and Photoshop Express. An increase in demand for creative cloud services like Adobe Stock, which helped fill the void created when live photography and video shoots had to be postponed, and all of this results in record traffic to Adobe.com, our world-class acquisition and growth engine, and a hub for customer engagement across all surfaces. 
We continue to deliver groundbreaking product innovation, including neural filters and super resolution features in Photoshop that harness the power of AI and machine learning to simplify complex workflows and enhance images in seconds. Extending our applications to multiple surfaces with Illustrator on the iPad and Fresco on the iPhone, and building collaboration capabilities with Creative Cloud libraries. In support of our commitment to digital citizenship, we're leading the Content Authenticity Initiative, now with over 150 members, to set the standard for transparency and attribution across the content ecosystem. We recently founded the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity to advance broad adoption of content authenticity standards. This year has shown us the mission-critical role that digital documents increasingly play in powering a modern business of any size. In a world where work needs to be done from anywhere and with anyone, digital workflows have become the critical underpinning to drive productivity and efficiency across global teams. With Document Cloud, we're accelerating document productivity, redefining how people view, edit, share, scan, and sign documents across desktops, web, mobile, and through frictionless PDF services. Through our document services, we're unleashing the PDF ecosystem with APIs for third-party developers to customize the digital document experience. Q1 Document Cloud performance was stellar with net new Document Cloud ARR of 98 million and record revenue of 480 million. Q1 highlights include outstanding Acrobat growth across all routes to market, significant traffic increases to our Acrobat web experience, which delivers the ability to successfully complete PDF verb functionality in the browser, driven by best-in-class search engine optimization. Powerful new Acrobat capabilities to accomplish converting, protecting, and merging PDFs in the browser, furthering our strategy to make the PDF experience frictionless across devices and platforms. Demand for our Acrobat Mobile and Adobe Scan apps. Strong momentum for Adobe Sign, which is enabling critical e-signature workflows in businesses and government institutions around the world. Delivery of an enhanced PDF reading experience with Acrobat Liquid Mode which leverages Adobe Sensei to automatically reformat PDFs for quick and easy consumption. And key customer wins, including Amazon, Aeon Services, Bank of America, Federal Aviation Administration, Merck, and National Australia Bank. The pandemic accelerated the need for digital transformation among businesses of all sizes across both B2C and B2B. Small and mid-sized businesses had to quickly set up digital storefronts. Enterprises that had not yet made substantial digital investments took the leap, and those with significant digital footprints doubled down further. As the world begins to reopen, digital businesses will be the winners. Only companies that have a deep understanding of their customers' preferences and the ability to personalize experiences at every stage of the customer journey will survive and thrive. Adobe created the customer experience management category 10 years ago that we continue to lead. Experience Cloud, built on a next-gen open platform, is the most comprehensive solution for content and commerce, data insights and audiences, customer journeys, and most recently, marketing workflow. Through our acquisition of Workfront, Adobe has a unique opportunity to create a unified marketing system of record, bringing workflow management, efficiency, and productivity gains to marketing teams challenged with siloed applications. Over a thousand shared customers are already benefiting from the integration and synergies between Experience Cloud and Workfront. Experience Cloud revenue was 934 million in Q1, with subscription revenue of 812 million representing 27% year-over-year growth. Q1 highlights include momentum for Adobe Experience Platform, which continues to be the platform of choice for enterprise customers to deliver real-time personalization at scale. Increasing demand for our commerce offerings. 
The Adobe Digital Index predicts that the pandemic has permanently boosted online spend by 20%, and 2022 will be the first trillion-dollar year in e-commerce. Solid performance in the workfront business, demonstrating the need for a unified marketing workflow solution to drive productivity across global teams. Enhancements in customer journey analytics, delivering advanced anomaly detection, contribution analysis, and intelligent alerts that identify hidden data patterns to more precisely understand customer behavior. Powering the digital modernization of government agencies across state, county, and city levels in all 50 U.S. states. Governments are revamping their online presence, making websites and apps easier to navigate, ensuring content is personalized and updated in real time, and creating intuitive forms that work on any device. Key customer wins, including Abbott Labs, Deutsche Post, Coca-Cola, FedEx, Kaiser Permanente, Mondelez, State of Illinois, and Sydney Water Corporation, and industry analyst recognition in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for digital experience platforms and the Forrester Agile Content Management Systems Wave Report. This is the fourth year in a row that Adobe was placed as a leader in the DXP Magic Quadrant and the sixth consecutive time Forrester has recognized Adobe's industry leadership in their CMS-focused WAVE reports. Adobe Summit, our annual digital experience conference, will be hosted virtually at the end of April across the globe. In addition to unveiling exciting new technology innovation in Experience Cloud, we will have customers and inspirational leaders from companies that have been on the front lines, including Albert Borla, CEO of Pfizer, and Rajesh Subramaniam, President and COO of FedEx. Adobe's fortitude is rooted in an unwavering focus on our employees, groundbreaking innovation, and our purpose, which is to harness the best of Adobe to make a significant impact in the world. At Adobe, it's not only about what we do, but how we do it. I'm proud of our continued industry recognition including being named to multiple lists celebrating Adobe as a great and equitable place to work for all, and being recognized on Fast Company's Most Innovative Companies list, Fortune's Most Admired Companies list, and the CDP's Climate Change A list. I'm especially thankful to our 23,000 employees around the globe whose dedication and talents delivered extraordinary results across every dimension of our business during these unprecedented times. Q1 was a record quarter for Adobe. As a result of our outstanding performance, tremendous opportunity across our business, and continued confidence in our global execution, we are raising our annual targets. John? Thanks, Jantanu. Q1 was a fantastic start to the year for Adobe, with strong financial results across all of our businesses. We accelerated revenue growth, expanded operating margins, and continue to drive demand across our portfolio of products and services, which are clearly resonating with enterprises and individuals in a world where digital has become the default. Harnessing the power of data, we continue to utilize our data-driven operating model, or DDOM, to drive traffic to Adobe.com, generate demand for our products, acquire new customers, and increase engagement. We are investing in massive market opportunities, delivering innovations across our products, and Workfront had a great first quarter as part of the Adobe family. As a result, in Q1, Adobe achieved record revenue of $3.91 billion, which represents 26% year-over-year growth. Recall that Q1 was a 14-week quarter for us versus the typical 13-week quarter. Business and financial highlights included GAAP diluted earnings per share of $2.61 and non-GAAP diluted earnings per share of $3.14. Digital media revenue of $2.86 billion, net new digital media ARR of $435 million, digital experience revenue of $934 million, cash flows from operations of $1.77 billion, remaining performance obligation of $11.61 billion exiting the quarter, and repurchasing approximately 1.9 million shares of our stock during the quarter. In Q1, we saw continual recovery in the business environment both in the U.S. and internationally, particularly with small and medium businesses, which contributed to our strong financial performance in the quarter. In our digital media segment, we achieved 32% year-over-year revenue growth in Q1, and we exited the quarter with $10.69 billion of digital media ARR. 
We achieved creative revenue of $2.38 billion, which represents 31% year-over-year growth. And we added $337 million of net new creative ARR. Our creative growth in Q1 was driven by strong consumer demand for our creative solutions on Adobe.com, driving improvements in usage, retention, and engagement across our products, growth in our mobile business through app store subscriptions and top of funnel awareness, continued recovery in the SMB segment, which we target with our Creative Cloud for Teams offering, and investing in targeted campaigns and promotions to drive awareness and acquire new users, including in emerging markets. Adobe Document Cloud delivered another quarter of accelerated revenue growth. We achieved Document Cloud revenue of $480 million, which represents 37% year-over-year growth, and we added $98 million of net new Document Cloud ARR. Documents are the currency of business, and the imperative for digitization has never been greater. Our document cloud growth in Q1 was driven by increasing demand for Acrobat subscriptions across all geos, strong enterprise term licensing with institutions, utilizing DDOM insights to drive improved conversion on Adobe.com, success in the reseller channel, both for subscriptions and our perpetual offering, including seat growth in the SMB segment, and strength in Adobe Sign, which grew revenue more than 50% year-over-year in the quarter. Turning to our digital experience segment, in Q1, we achieved revenue of $934 million, which represents 24% year-over-year growth. Digital experience subscription revenue was $812 million, representing 27% year-over-year growth. Our Q1 results continue to validate the strength of our industry-leading customer experience management, or CXM, solutions. Large enterprises across industries and geographies are standardizing on Adobe to manage customer interactions, gain actual insights, and unify their customer data with the Adobe Experience platform. In our commerce business, we continue to sign large deals with new customers and drive upsells at renewal points, enabling every business to transact online. Optimizing customer journeys across all channels in a digital first world is critical to enterprises, and we see momentum with our larger customers adopting our complete Experience Cloud offering to drive omni-channel personalization at scale. We are driving the global CXM mandate across B2B and B2C, from large enterprises to mid-sized companies, across multiple verticals. Recent wins included expanding our reach in the public sector, where we are enabling critical constituent-facing services, and adoption in the mid-market of our new AEM cloud service, Adobe Commerce, and Marketo Engage. Lastly, we are off to a fast start in integrating Workfront and driving the strategic value proposition of combining best-in-class workflow technology with Adobe's leading CXM and creative solutions. Workfront contributed $38 million of revenue in Q1 after purchase accounting adjustments to deferred revenue. We continue to drive savings from travel and entertainment and facilities operations as our employees work from home. We are expanding investment and hiring globally, particularly for R&D and sales and marketing roles, in order to capitalize on our large addressable markets. From a quarter-over-quarter currency perspective, FX increased revenue by $37 million. Net of impacts from hedging, the sequential currency increase to revenue was $34 million. From a year-over-year currency perspective, FX increased revenue by $62 million. Net of impacts from hedging, the year-over-year currency increase to revenue was $44 million. Adobe's effective tax rate in Q1 was 12% on a gap basis and 16% on a non-gap basis. The tax rate came in lower than expected, primarily due to a favorable tax ruling in the quarter, which allowed us to reduce our withholding taxes and receive refunds for certain prior payments. And to a lesser extent, larger than expected tax benefits associated with share-based payments and favorable resolutions of other income tax matters. Our trade DSO was 38 days, which compares to 41 days in the year ago quarter and 37 days last quarter. Remaining performance obligation grew 17% year-over-year to $11.61 billion exiting Q1. Deferred revenue exiting the quarter was $4.29 billion, growing 19% year-over-year. Our ending cash and short-term investment position exiting Q1 was $4.96 billion, which is sequentially down quarter-over-quarter due to the acquisition of Workfront. Cash flows from operations in Q1 were $1.77 billion. We repurchased approximately 1.9 million shares in the quarter at a cost of $888 million. We currently have $1.1 billion remaining of our $8 billion repurchase authority granted in May 2018, which we expect to be exhausted by the end of this fiscal year. In December 2020, we announced that our board authorized an additional $15 billion stock repurchase program through fiscal year 2024, which will be funded from future cash flow generation. 
For Q2, we are targeting total Adobe revenue of approximately $3.72 billion, digital media segment year-over-year revenue growth of approximately 21%, net new digital media ARR of approximately $450 million, digital experience segment revenue growth of approximately 18%, digital experience subscription revenue growth of approximately 20%, tax rate of approximately 19.5% on a gap basis, and 16% on a non-gap basis, share count of approximately 482 million shares, GAAP earnings per share of approximately $2.09, and non-GAAP earnings per share of approximately $2.81. In light of Adobe's strong Q1 business performance and the momentum reflected in our second quarter targets, we are increasing our annual targets for fiscal 2021. We are now targeting total Adobe revenue of approximately $15.45 billion, digital media segment year-over-year revenue growth of approximately 22%, net new digital media ARR of approximately $1.8 billion, digital experience segment revenue growth of approximately 20%, digital experience subscription revenue growth of approximately 23%, tax rate of approximately 17.5% on a GAAP basis and 16% on a non-GAAP basis, share count of approximately 481 million shares, GAAP earnings per share of approximately $9.13, non-GAAP earnings per share of approximately $11.85. In digital media ARR, we expect to return to normal pre-COVID summer seasonality, which can lead to sequentially lower net new ARR in Q3, followed by year-end strength in Q4. We expect operating margin to be relatively flat from Q2 to Q3 and then dip slightly in Q4 as we get back to spending on travel and reoccupying our facilities. In summary, Q1 was a great start, and we expect fiscal 2021 to be another record year. Combining our strength in customer acquisition and engagement, our leading technologies, and talented employee base, Adobe is poised to continue our track record of impressive top and bottom line growth. Lastly, as reported in our press release earlier today, I have expressed my intent to retire this year. It is a very difficult decision for me because I love Adobe, and you may ask why now. I have been very fortunate in my career, and I still have the passion and energy to fully dedicate myself to my philanthropic interests, as well as prioritize my family and friends. We have navigated our way extremely well during the pandemic, and our Q1 results and raised targets are evidence that the company is on solid footing. So I feel comfortable that this is the right time for me. Our highly tenured finance and operations team is top-notch, and I plan on helping Shantanu through a transition period as the company launches a search for my successor. Now I'll turn it back to Shantanu. John has played a critical role in Adobe's strong performance, for which I'm deeply grateful. John and the entire finance and operations organization have helped drive top and bottom line growth with a relentless focus on shareholder value. In addition to his accomplishments as CFO, John embodies Adobe's values, always operating with the highest integrity and ethical standards. John will work with me to ensure a smooth transition, and I'm happy that John will be able to focus on his family and philanthropic pursuits and wish him all the best. Adobe's global brand, unparalleled innovation, broad spectrum of customers and partners, and dedicated employees provide an unmatched competitive advantage. I remain bullish that technology will continue to transform work, learn, and play resulting in a brighter future for all of us. I will now turn the call over to the operator to take your questions. Thank you. And everyone, to ask a question, please press star then one on your telephone keypad. Please note that if you're on a speakerphone, to pick up your handset or depress your mute function to allow those signals to reach our system. Again, that is star one to ask a question. And we will go first to Cash Reagan of Goldman Sachs. Hello, thank you very much and congratulations on a spectacular quarter. Shantanu, my question, uh, again, naggingly, annoyingly, is about Credo 10. Uh, you've been very consistent in talking about how large the TAM for Creative is. I think it goes back to 10 years prior. Can you talk, and you, you mentioned today on this call that it's seemingly endless in terms of the opportunity. Can you expand on that? Why is that the case? Because the, 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 there is a view, uh, not, not that I share, that once the economy opens up, that the creative folks are going to get out and enjoy the summer vacations and do less creative stuff. 
So we take a bit of a back, back step with digital transformation. I, I don't know how you feel about that, but uh, if you can just talk to that tactical opening of the economy and if that might impede digital transformation, or maybe not, and then talk about why your confidence in the TAM of creative is even greater than, than it was, say, five years back. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to do that, Cash, and uh, it's good to have you back on our calls, uh, you know, now at Goldman. So uh, first, let me, let me just say that, you know, when you think about content and design, there is no question that it's fueling the global economy. And the way we segment our business is we think about what we are doing for creative pros, what we are doing for communicators, and what we are doing for consumers. And first, do I think uh, just share some numbers associated with that? I think we've said there are 49 million creative professionals uh, who use our products uh, to make a living. There's 700 million communicators and approximately 4 uh, billion consumers. And so when you think about the TAM, whether that's 20 billion for the creative pros, 15 billion for communicators, or 6 billion for consumers uh, in 2023, I mean, that represents a $41 billion addressable market opportunity given the importance of design. So it's a Massive opportunity. What gives us confidence? Uh, I think when we think about strategically what we are trying to do, uh, certainly the first thing we're trying to do is advance every creative category. And I'll just give you one example, Cash. I mean, what's happening with immersive media and when you think about uh, 3D to 2D and being able to do all these virtual shoots as the amount of content, that's an emerging business. I had a really great quarter. You know, that continues on what we had said about video uh, being. Uh, you know, one of the growth initiatives for us. So I think, you know, these new media types and advancing it is certainly critical. I think multi-surface systems, uh, what we can do associated with making sure mobile, mobile's been a really good growth opportunity for us. And the way we look at that, it's uh, both as a result of the funnel that it provides for both, you know, mobile and desktop, uh, but also as part of a system so people can create whenever they want. So even if they're going to be out in summer, as you say, uh, they'll have access to all of our creative tools uh, wherever they go. Uh, the third one I would say is, you know, what we're doing with collaboration and the team and everything associated with allowing people uh, to collaborate. Services. I mean, stock had another great quarter. You know, we grew that business approximately 30% year over year. And the notion of, you know, just continuing to make sure that we do creativity for all, I think the world is going to be in a place where uh, creative expression is going to dominate everything associated with education and productivity. So all of that give us uh, really uh, high confidence associated with the opportunity and our execution. And then if you think about it for Q1, really just quickly, I think Q1 was a record quarter. We continue to see uh, you know, really uh, great demand on the web associated with what's happening. And the absolute ARR was strong again. And this is as you point out, despite the recovery being complete. And so, you know, we just uh, feel like we're in an absolutely sweet spot as it relates to what people want to do with our tools and services. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thanks, Kesh. Our next question will come from Jennifer Lowe of UBS. Great, thank you. Um, maybe just, just following along, you know, sort of the commentary on recovery, um, one of the things that stood out to me is the strength that you saw in SMB this quarter. So maybe two questions on that. You know, first, are you kind of back to pre-COVID levels at this point in, in terms of SMB momentum, or is there still more to gain there? And then secondly, just specific on experience cloud, I know um, even pre-COVID, there were some execution challenges that you were experiencing in the SMB space. So have those execution challenges been sort of fully addressed and you're seeing some of those more mid-market oriented products that you've acquired executing the way you'd like to, work, the way you'd like them to? That's it for me, thanks. Yeah, first, I think as it relates to the SMB segment, uh, as we mentioned, both in uh, the document cloud and creative cloud and to your question specifically around uh, experience cloud, we did see, uh, you know, continued momentum and growth. So uh, I still think that, you know, when you think about what's happening in the world, it's still not fully back, right, to normal. And we're still in a sort of a pandemic situation. So I clearly think there's upside. And, uh, you know, every day you have good news in certain geographies and unfortunately not so good news. And so that only augurs well for us as we look at our business uh, moving forward. 
But if I take a big picture view associated with Experience Cloud, uh, which was the second part of your question, you know, digital transformation, uh, just talking to all the CEOs that I'm talking to, those who've already invested in digital are absolutely doubling down because they recognize that this is the way to further differentiate. And those who are not are clearly investing in the people, technology, and processes to be in this market, uh, whether it's transformational accounts at the enterprise level that Anil talked about at the financial analyst meeting, or whether it's at the small and medium business, your question associated with what we're able to do to enable them to have a digital storefront, uh, which is an absolute necessity for doing business today. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interest and demand in both of those. I know a lot of you, as I read your reports, uh, you know, the checks that you're doing, you're hearing the interest in our solutions and the from both the customers and the partners is high. And so we are going to see uh, more demand for this. We had a good quarter. If you look at how we are targeting DX, uh, we clearly expect acceleration of revenue without with and without work front, Q3 over Q2 and Q4 over Q3. So we're you know, really excited, and I think we're in the sweet spot on all three uh, of our growth areas. Great. Thank you. And the next question will come from Mark Modeler of Bernstein Research. Thank you very much, and congratulations on the quarter and a great start to the year. John, we're going to miss you, but completely understand the desire to spend more time with family and philanthropy, so uh, enjoy it. Um, two quarters ago, you called out your increased focus on driving experience cloud margin improvement. Um, can you give us an update on where you are in driving experience cloud margin improvement and any sense to what you think about long-term margins could be for what experience cloud is today versus the future? Thank you. Well, Mark, uh, I'll let John speak to his decision after this uh, as well. But I, I think, you know, the decisions we made associated with reducing our focus on the transaction-based advertising revenue, if you look at everything that's happening associated with that business, so there are other companies in that space. I think that was a good uh, way to do it. Uh, what we've done with the experience platform and with Anil coming in, taking, you know, a soup to nuts approach associated with that entire a PNL and the business opportunity, he's been able to align and simplify and improve it. And so, I mean, you know, you don't accomplish the kinds of margins that we accomplished in the year without a focus across all of our businesses. And so, you know, we have an incredibly good leverage model, but there's more. I mean, digital experience is still in that area where we're growing revenue. You know, I mean, 20% uh, is what we've targeted for the entire year. We had 27% of subscription revenue in Q1. And so it really is one of those areas that's a growth opportunity, and you will see that uh, translate into uh, the bottom line over time. But, John, maybe I'll have you also add to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I think the, the continued focus that we have both on um, gross margin and on operating margin in the business is, is, is key. And, uh, Mark, thanks for the, the words. I, I am definitely going to miss you guys as well, but I will be here for a little while during the transition. Uh, you can imagine there's a difficult you know, decision to make. You think about these things for a while, but I have to say that even last year during the pandemic, you, you kind of refocus on some priorities. And so I'm really fortunate for uh, the great career I've had and thankful to Shops and Adobe to allow me this opportunity to pursue my passions. Thank you. I appreciate it. And congrats. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Brent Thill of Jeffries. Good afternoon, Shanyu. Uh, you had mentioned uh, a couple years ago at Summit uh, that the, the customer data platform architecture was a, was a revolutionary architecture and was going to bring some really interesting opportunities to, to Adobe. Uh, it sounds like some of those customers are going live now and I'm just curious to get your perspective on where you're at on that journey and, and what you're starting to see in Experience Cloud with, with CDP coming online. Yeah, Brent, I mean, uh, we have seen some uh, quite a bit of success. I think we had some really blue-chip customers that we talked about, the conversations that I'm having uh, with each of these customers. And, you know, people talk about Customer 360. We're the only major company that has anything out there of this scale uh, to be able to do real-time personalization at scale. We have billions of profiles that are already going through this. 
absolutely blue chip customers, whether it's in financial services, whether it's in uh, other online like retail, what we are doing with telecommunications. And so uh, not only do we have that, but it's really served as the basis for what we've done with customer journey analytics. So if you take a step back and, you know, the big areas that we talked about, content and commerce, data insights and audiences, which is such a key part, I think that becomes even more important with what's happening in the cookie world so that you can have access to all your first party data and profiles. So I think the decision to invest in that was right. The success that we're seeing in the marketplace and the leadership, uh, I think positions us incredibly well, uh, Brent. And you'll hear a lot more about that at uh, you know, uh, Summit. Certainly, I think the Workfront acquisition also has had the unique opportunity to be able to add uh, to what we have in terms of our solutions and get workflow also and attribution associated with it. So I feel really good, but I feel really good about the infrastructure uh, with CDP. And, you know, we uh, focus a lot more on the real-time nature of what we can do with personalization as the key differentiation. But some great customer wins. Just a quick follow-up for John. Uh, on the 20% growth you're now guiding, just back to Jen's question, does that assume a full recovery recovery for SMB, or is that still contemplating, hey, that, that there's still still some improvement that you could you could squeeze out of that that segment of the market? Yeah, thanks, Brent. Yeah, no, for sure, it it really reflects the continued recovery, but it's not, you know, we don't expect to be back to pre-COVID levels. Um, I think, you know, as we saw as, as we exited FY20, that uh, momentum in SMB kind of recovery, it's just this gradual and continual recovery, and we're, we're getting the benefit of that. Brent, you Brent, followed you. us for a significant amount of time. Uh, we don't bank on anything dramatically changing. We look at the demand that we have and the current trends. And you know, I, we're not macroeconomic uh, experts, and so you know, as the recovery happens more, but we are not banking on it. Just to be clear. Thanks, Shannon. And we'll go now to Kirk Marine of Evercore as ISI. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Shantidu, I was just kind of curious, as, as we come out of the pandemic, I mean, your business is executed incredibly well. Uh, are there parts of the business, though, that would benefit from getting back in front of the customer base? Uh, I'm thinking about sort of the experience cloud business in particular. Uh, you guys have obviously been able to execute really well in a virtual world, but, uh, but I do wonder if there's areas, whether it's experience cloud, maybe in the education market, areas like that, where you know, being able to get out and talk to the customers again would actually be beneficial. Um, you know, so I was just curious if you had any thoughts on that. I think so. I mean, you know, the world has done a pretty amazing job of pivoting to working at home and being able to, you know, uh, do as much as you can. And I've, I've talked about the fact that being able to visit with customers all across the globe without travel is in many ways, uh, you know, a real ability to scale. But I, I also am one who believes that being in front of the customers and getting, you know, the partners that we have together and accelerating the rollout and sharing best practices and that social part is only going to help. Uh, I don't think the world's going back uh, to everybody being in the office, but I, I do believe that it will be an accelerant. And, you know, I, because uh, people's desire to also invest more uh, as the eco economic situation improves can only be a, another tailwind for us. And so we've done a pretty incredible job. I mean, when you look at our numbers, but there's no question in my mind. I mean, if he can go travel and if he can meet with those customers and do it, there's only upside associated with that. Both and in terms just of what we can do as well as, sorry, both in terms of what we can do as well as their own confidence, right, in uh, continuing to expand their investments. Thanks for that. And then just be a quick one for John. John, on the, you know, the work, work front, revenue came in a little bit higher than your initial expectation. Was that just mainly around sort of deferred accounting? I realize you probably took a fairly conservative view on that, given you had closed the acquisition where you talked to us in December. But, but you know, it sounds like you got off to a good start. Was there any uplift maybe in the, in the bookings or revenue just in terms of the combination, or, or was that mainly just sort of uh, a, a factor of accounting? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ken. No, the uh, workfront actually really did have great performance. So outside of the accounting adjustments for um, purchase accounting, we saw momentum in the business. And, you know, we had, you know, kind of 
suggested maybe about 140, 150 million in workfront revenue impacting FY um, 21, but we think it'll be a, a bit more than that given the performance because the combined offering is really resonating with our customer base, and that was really the the you know from the business case of doing this acquisition to begin with. Okay, and we'll move to our next. We'll go to that next question, and that'll come from Jay Felishauer of Griffin Securities. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, Shantanu, for you first. Uh, at the analyst meeting in December, uh, the company had some very interesting things to say about uh, your technology and, and where you're investing. Uh, you referred, for example, in the case of Creative to what you called a uh, a deeply collaborative shared system. In the case of DocCloud, you refer to uh, intelligence applied to PDF as with liquid mode, uh, all of that in the context of your, your applications and intelligence services. The question is, could you foresee the role for or need for um, new configurations or a new kind of segmentation of the product line, um, new SKUs, new packaging, anything of that sort, uh, particularly as you become more domain-specific uh, oriented. And then uh, for John, um, over the last three quarters, you've had a very steep, almost V-shaped recovery uh, in, your, uh, in your job openings uh, from almost none back in June, July to now uh, over 1,000 um, and up four months in a row year over year. Um, could you talk about um, that in terms of your onboarding and the context of how you were thinking about um, OPEX growth for the year? Jay, maybe um, I'll take your question, and since there haven't been as many questions yet on Document Cloud, I'll use Document Cloud uh, with the technology lens to answer your question. I mean, uh, first, liquid mode. Uh, I was on the road. I was traveling on the road uh, last week, and the entire preparation for this I was doing on a mobile device with liquid mode. And I will tell you, liquid mode for me was an absolute lifesaver in terms of being able to look at all these documents and do everything uh, collaboratively on the road. So uh, an unabashed uh, plug for those who haven't tried liquid mode or haven't tried Adobe Scan uh, to really see how it changes. And the way we think about it is when you apply that kind of AI to fundamentally change the nature and understanding the structure and semantics of documents, it opens up so many different po uh, possibilities on the segmentation. I mean, we now have revenue that we drive through reader and reader distribution and upsells because we understand what people are trying to do and understand their intent. We're driving revenue through search engine optimization that we do on PDF because we have a one-click way of having them do more and more PDF web functionality. We have a new revenue monetization model associated with APIs and being able to have people use PDF and embed that in their particular workflows. And you know, we've always had Acrobat. Sign had a great uh, quarter again. I think uh, John may have mentioned that we grew 50%. And so um, to your point, I mean, AI and technology and being able to make that available and accessible in different ways is not just serving the customers better, but it's clearly providing us new opportunities to monetize it that previously did not exist. And so I think you'll continue to see that. Uh, I mean, the innovation roadmap, whether it's Summit or Max, uh, you'll see some really cool things, which will not just push the envelope for our creative pros, but also make it way more accessible, productive, and fun for communicators and consumers. And they, uh, in yeah, in, in regards to uh, the you know the job openings, the headcount growth. You know, when we entered the pandemic last year, you know, we did pause hiring initially, as we talked about, to really focus our resources on our highest priorities, and uh, we did that and successfully you know navigated the pandemic and really kind of um, taking advantage of the opportunities in front of us. And so with that, of course, you know, we we talked about in Q3 that we were going to start to ramp hiring, and so we we have done that, and we continue to look to invest. As I said, in um, R and D and sales capacity, and as well as variable marketing. You know, in terms of the impact on OpEx, you know, we had originally planned for uh, margin expansion in FY21 over FY20, and these updated targets actually indicate an even greater margin expansion. Even though it'll it accounts for our phased reentry as we come back to traveling, as we reopen our facilities. Um, so, you know, for us, it's you know the ability to grow the top line and the leverage in our operating. Uh, model allows us to be able to do that. So for us, yeah, margin expansion is really all driven off of uh, revenue growth, and ultimately yeah, we can um, you know, perform both very well on the top line and on the bottom line. Right. 
Thank you. And next, we will go to Sakit Kolya of Barclays Capital. Okay, great. Hey, thanks for taking my question here, guys, and, and congrats, John, on, on the well-deserved retirement. Um, Shantanu, maybe for you on, on the creative business, can, can you just talk about the product pipeline for that growing individual user base for the rest of 2021, broad brushes, of course, and, and how you feel about Adobe's ability to help them grow or, or progress in their journey to higher-end creative cloud apps. And, and John, if I can just uh, fit in one housekeeping question that, that maybe we, might, might be helpful. I was wondering if you could just quantify how much the extra week added to total revenue and, and net new ARR in the quarter. Yeah, Saket, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll speak to that and I'll also give you my color on sort of uh, what happened with ARR. Uh, but uh, first, as it relates to, uh, you know, how we're expanding uh, both the user base and acquisitions, I mean, the net new ARR, when you look at it, it's primarily all net new ARR in terms of customer acquisition. And uh, whether it's the mobile-only uh, applications that we're providing, whether it's the web-based uh, ability to do things in the browser, whether it's collaboration, uh, that's certainly the way uh, in which we are expanding our offering. And frankly, the way we do it is that anybody who uses one of our on-ramp products, whether it's a individual category app that is then using the entire CC All apps, or whether it's a consumer app where they start to get exposed to things like maybe layers in Photoshop or a timeline in Premiere Rush, uh, they have the ability to then uh, be upsold as well as to become more productive by going to Premiere uh, or Photoshop. So it's very much been a part of our strategy all along, which is uh, how do you uh, attract customers to the platform and how do you think about uh, you know, then making sure that as they grow in their creative endeavors, that we have the right on-ramp, whether it's an offer that we provide at the right time, whether it's engagement that we do with Adobe Creative Live. I mean, Creative Live has really become, in that community of Behance, a great way for people to continue to grow and learn. And uh, I think there are a whole cottage industry also of people uh, who've done training and learning and uh, you know, education on creative products. So that that's the strategy, which is meet the customer where they are, whether it's on a surface or whether it's a degree of specialization, and then make sure that as they expand their creative uh, you know, pursuits, that we're the right product for that. And so if you think about it, I mean, you know, digital media ARR, what really happens is it's not, while revenue may be more representative of the number of weeks in a quarter, and so if you take the 14 week over 13 week, you can argue that, you know, it was probably eight points uh, of revenue uh, that was uh, extra as a result of the 14th week. But ARR is not as cyclical because ARR, you know, when you have an enterprise part of the business, uh, it's probably going to be back end loaded by most enterprise, you know, much like enterprise. So I, that's why we look at the Q1 ARR, which was a record for creative as a really solid performance. So hopefully that gives you a flavor. Revenue for creative is a little bit more, uh, you know, dependent on the number of weeks. But ARR is sort of, you know, you have these uh, things that we do which are cyclical, and, you know, that drives uh, the strong growth that we saw across both creative and documents. Very helpful, Sean. Thanks. Thank you. And next we will go to Ken Wong of Guggenheim Securities. Great. Th thanks for taking my question. Uh, I just wanted to dive in a little bit on, on the digital experience business. Would love some color behind the confidence in the 23% the DX subgrowth. Uh, is this purely just you know, m improving macro, or are you guys seeing better deal flows, bigger deals, specific products that are contributing to this, this uptick? Uh, and any help there would be fantastic. Yeah, I think the confidence comes from first the performance in Q1. As we said, we had 27%, uh, you know, our, our subscription revenue growth. I think the confidence comes from the conversations that we're all having with companies all across the globe, uh, from the pipeline that we have, uh, from what we know uh, in terms of Summit. And again, as uh, in the response to the previous question that was asked, this is not banking on any macroeconomic environment changes for the rest of the year. So it's based on what we know today and uh, the interest. Commerce is an area that is seeing a fair amount of interest. The real-time 
uh, customer data platform, the experience platform is seeing a, a significant amount of interest. Workfront, as we said, and John mentioned that uh, it's not uh, the deferred revenue, it's the performance as well that's driving the upside in that particular business. Customer journey analytics and being able to address this in a multi-channel, that's seeing a lot of interest. I think you're going to see some uh, new products also in terms of how we evolve our campaign product and analytics product to be more business performance related. And, you know, frankly, uh, to a large extent, uh, Ken, all of this is also predicated on how we run our business, right? And uh, our DDOM and understanding what it takes to run an online business. And we're world-class at that and we're building products for ourselves. And so that gives us a lot of confidence that it will help every other customer out there. Great, great. thanks a lot for that insight. And next, we will go to Sterling Audi of J.P. Morgan. Yeah, thanks. Hi, guys. First, John, congratulations on a wonderful tenure as CFO of Adobe. Just one question from my side. You touched upon Adobe Sign and the 50% growth that you saw in the quarter. It seems like meaningful acceleration from what we saw you know, a year or so ago, where I think that business was growing about 25%. Uh, I'm going to take a stab. Any sense? Can would you be willing to quantify and size the Adobe Sign business at the, this point? And then, second, in terms of the accelerating growth, um, I think you mentioned government, but what what are you particularly seeing that's driving you know the uptake of that e-signature business? I think our key differentiation there, Sterling, is the fact that you know PDF as a format uh, continues to be the you know, format that people are using for automating uh, these uh, workflows. I think the fact that we have Adobe Reader, uh, uh, which is the operating environment in which all of these workflows are happening, um, I think we've done a better job at awareness, frankly, uh, of what we have in that. Hopefully some of you have seen the uh, incredibly new creative campaigns that we're running associated with that. We're actually getting a, a fair amount of uh, wins from other uh, you know, competitive products that people might have been using in terms of, you know, moving over to Adobe, the partnerships that we have uh, with uh, Microsoft and ServiceNow uh, in terms of being embedded, whether it's in SharePoint or Outlook, or, you know, or partnering with ServiceNow. So I think we're executing on the product side. I think we have some key differentiation. And this is not a zero-sum game. It's such a large opportunity. And, you know, I think the work from home has also uh, certainly uh, benefited us and everybody else in that space. So all of those, uh, I think, are reasons why, you know, sign just continues to be uh, uh, a real growth opportunity for us. I, the last thing I would mention is the ability to embed our sign stuff within other people's offerings as well. I think we've made some good progress on that one as well. So all of these give us confidence. And uh, to your question, Sterling, we don't break it out because it's hard, right? Sometimes you have an enterprise deal where you have all of them using Acrobat and Sign. And so uh, even on the individual case, you have uh, the ability to use a, a certain amount of Sign capability with an Acrobat. And so I think our strength is in the combined offering. Got it, thank you. And next we will go to Keith Bachman of Bank of Montreal. Hi, thank you very much. Shantanu, I was wondering if you could give an update on the commerce cloud, and I'll break it into two two parts. A, could you talk a little bit about uh, growth rates and profiles? In other words, are, are you moving into uh, larger situations with more scalable demands? And B, could you talk a little bit about uh, you moved through acquisition into the commerce area, and it fits into the DDOM model, and yet you and yet you're still partnering on the services side of the equation of the service cloud. I just wanted to uh, see if you could juxtapose your strategy surrounding willingness to move, move into commerce via M&A and any thoughts on is partnering still the right strategy for the services side. Thank you. Yeah, at the end of the day, uh, you know, Keith, we are a, a software uh, company, and so I think – Actually, just to give you a, a little bit of an update on numbers, I mean, the beauty of when we acquired uh, Magento and put it in the commerce cloud was, uh, you know, first it was B2B and B2C. That was a, a attractive area for us. Second, it was physical goods and digital goods. That was an interesting uh, opportunity for us. 
I think the third thing that was important for us was the fact that we had the ability to have both a large ecosystem of partners who were implementing this as well as an open source community that was able to, you know, extend the functionality and in effect be a, a extended R&D model. Um, on the partner side, I mean, I think we've gone something from 2,800 or so partners that they had to well over 4,000. So the interest in partnering with us on the commerce cloud is high. And, you know, our model, as we've always said, this goes back also to the earlier question that somebody had on the P&L associated with digital experience. Our model is software, and we're happy actually to have a large ecosystem of partners that work with it. And maybe the last thing I would say on that particular front is that we're really continuing to expand what we do on the merchant services offering. So, you know, partners like PayPal and what we can do in conjunction with them and other, uh, you know, uh, credit card and, and other partners, I think that's going to also uh, be a good area of continued growth for us. Okay, thank you, Shantan. Thank you. Operator, we'll take two more questions and then wrap up. Thanks. Certainly. And next we will go to Derek Wood of Cowan and Company. Uh, great, thanks. Um, question on Document Cloud, uh, maybe the first part for John. It looks like Perpetual was quite strong, and I suspect that came from uh, from strength in ETLA activity. But um, could you need to talk to how you're thinking about Perpetual Mix as we look through the rest of the year and whether we could see a, another spike in any given quarter? And then, and then maybe more for Sean New, just a, kind of a refresher around the strategy um, within Document Cloud on, on getting more customers to ship the subscription and, and how to think about those efforts over the next couple of years. Also, maybe I'll go with the strategy, and then, John, you can certainly add to that, which was, I mean, so, you know, first yeah. from a strategic point of view, uh, if you go to adobe.com, it's primarily a subscription. And so, you know, we've done a fantastic job of converting that business to subscription. When you look at it globally and you consider some other markets where a lot of it is going through the resellers, even that has predominantly become um, you know, subscription, but we'd be crazy not to have people if they do want some perpetual to buy the perpetual and then convert it to subscription because we still know that. So I think to your uh, Uber point, yes, we did see some strength in perpetual. Uh, you know, China, I think, had also a a pretty strong quarter as it related to Acrobat, and that may be a little bit more perpetual. Our strategy is clearly moving into the cloud. Our strategy is clearly demonstrating the value of, of where people, uh, you know, see the ongoing innovation that we're providing. Uh, but you know, that business, unlike the other business, we just want to attract more and more customers through any one of those offerings, and that's why we've continued to have the. Acrobat uh, perpetual uh, offer out there, but it, it's becoming smaller and smaller as a big as a part of the business. It's definitely becoming smaller and smaller. And on Adobe.com, it's virtually de minimis. Great, thanks. And we'll go to our final question, and that'll be from Keith Weiss of Morgan Stanley. Excellent, thank you guys for for sneaking me in. And um, uh, again, my uh, Congratulations to John on uh, the retirement, um, well-deserved. And also really nice quarter. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about a concern that I hear from investors and, and kind of get your take on it. Um, while you guys are seeing a recovery on the S&P side of the equation, the fact of the matter is the, the digital media business did really well through all of last year, um, even in the, the, the height of the pandemic in the upcoming May quarter, you guys saw really good um, ARR growth. It was up on a year-on-year -year basis, which exceeded a lot of people's expectations. But now there, there's a concern that there's a really tough comp ahead, that you guys saw work-from-home benefits or benefits that were due to sort of what was going on with the crisis that, that might create a, a difficult compare can you talk about whether there is like a difficult compare ahead and, and is there a different sort of tone or nature of the business that you're seeing now versus what you saw last year at this time um, as we're in the crisis? I think, Keith, the question that we ask ourselves is uh, the big shifts that we've seen uh, in terms of how people work, the need to create, uh, the, do, the different kinds of media types that exist. Is there anything that's going to fundamentally change when the economy, uh, you know, uh, changes? Uh, and we don't think so because we just continue to believe that the importance of all of those areas 
and the tailwinds that exist in the market will continue to exist. I mean, I think in terms of our numbers, uh, and you look at what we are doing, uh, you know, where we've said it's, uh, uh, you know, we've raised the target a little bit, uh, you know, from what we had, the 1.75 billion to the 1.8 billion. And this is 10 years into it when you're driving, you know, record ARR. I would say that, you know, that reflects the much larger market opportunity that we've created for ourselves. And so uh, is there, the way I actually look at it, Keith, is that it's brought more attention to what's possible with our tools. And once people experience the benefits of what they're doing with us, um, it's going to be hard to go back uh, to, you know, not using those uh, kinds of technologies, which is what gives us a lot of interest. I Hopefully, uh, and you were certainly there, Keith, at the uh, analyst meeting. That's why we try to lay out completely what we see in terms of communicators and uh, consumers and creative pros and I mean, the business is doing really well. We had, we're expanding the digital media segment revenue for the year. We're expanding a revenue. And so that's all based on, you know, what we see as demand for uh, what we have created and the tremendous amount of innovation uh, that's ahead of us. So I think all of those uh, give us uh, a lot of confidence in the fundamental nature of the growth opportunities that we're focused on. And since that was the last question, I mean, maybe just a couple of points uh, I would like to, and I know a lot of you did, also uh, publicly thank John. Um, this was, I know for John, a very personal decision, and I'm happy uh, that he's going to be able to focus on what's important to him, which is family and his philanthropic uh, interests, and I'm deeply grateful. And on the overall business, uh, it's hard. It's hard to believe that a year has passed since the pandemic impacted the world, uh, but I think what's really incredible is digital is not just a nice to have right now, it's absolutely mission critical. And most companies would be thrilled to have one area of uh, growth. We have three areas of growth, creativity, storytelling, design, uh, what's happening with the future of work and remote work and the limitations of what you can do with in-person interaction, which will lead to more automation of digital documents. And, you know, how every business in the planet is going to focus on engaging digitally with their customers. So massive opportunity. I think Q1 was a really strong quarter. We have a compelling strategy, an outstanding innovation roadmap. And, you know, I, I really have to thank all our employees who've pivoted to work from home and executed magnificently uh, in what have been difficult uh, circumstances, and which is why the momentum led us to increase our targets for 21. And as I always say, I think the top line and bottom line performance really set us apart as a investment uh, for people. But stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and we really look forward to having you attend Summit, where we will unveil the next generation of enterprise innovation. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I'll pass it back to Jonathan. Okay, thanks, Shantanu, and this concludes the call. Thanks, everyone. And again, everyone, this does conclude today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.